Hello, my name is Scott Bonds, and I'd like to share with you some of the men who spoke to me. There were many men who spoke to me as I was a child, watching and learning how to become a man. I'm gonna talk about a lot of these men leading up to my dad, but I'd like to start with Ronald Murphy. Ronald Murphy was a very close friend of my father. They grew up together. He was my godfather. And so I was around Mr. Murphy, as many call him, I know him as Uncle Murphy. I was around Murphy all the time. He was a, it seemed like he was a permanent fixture in my world. He would always have change in his pocket. He would always give me money when he saw me, but he owned a convenience store right in the black community. Um, he used to sell sub sandwiches and all types of, of other items, you know, household goods, detergents and all kind of stuff like that. But he showed black people that ownership was possible. He made a reality known to us that you could actually own your own store. And in that, during that time period in the 70s, that was monumental. And I suspected he had stuff going on before I can even remember, you know. So I'm saying in the 70s, but I'm sure he was doing stuff even before I was aware that he was doing stuff. And so I want to give Ronald Murphy his flowers right now because he was an inspiration to many, many black people in the community at that time and still is to this very day. Another person I'd like to mention is Mr. Young. Mr. Young was a barber. Um, I met him when he was at Brown and Young on Bloomfield Avenue in Montclair. And eventually he went his own separate ways and separated from Mr. Brown and opened up Young's World of Beauty. And Mr. Young was a very inspirational person to the black community as many barbers are or used to be because barbers and hairstylists are very important in the black community in the relationships that they create and they build but mr young had an image he always drove a nice car he was always clean cut had his little mustache you know his little fade you know little box fade haircut and everything um you might go in this in his barbershop and you might see Patrick Ewan sitting in his chair. He would have these pictures of people he'd met before. And one of the most memorable ones to me was Muhammad Ali. And so, you know, he was a very upstanding, very strong black man in the community. And Mr. Young actually was the first person who recognized that I had some talent in cutting hair because I used to cut the kids' hair in the neighborhoods, my friend. And he would see my work and one day he pulled me to the side and he offered me an apprenticeship in his barbershop. At that time, my response to him was, man, I'm a businessman. I just cut hair for fun. I'm not trying to be no barber. You know, I appreciate the offer. Several years later, I went off to college and then I went to Dudley's Cosmetology University and earned my degree in cosmetology. And when I came back home, the first place I wanted to go was to Mr. Young and I wanted to let him know that he was right. He was the first one that saw my talent in that in, in that industry and I had become very successful as not just a barber, but, but as a cosmetologist and as an educator and platform artist amongst many things that I did in the industry. And so I just wanna let Mr. Young know how much I appreciate all that he inspired in me. He passed away several years ago. I hate I didn't get to see him again before he passed, but I know he's listening and I want to say thank you, Mr. Young. There were some other people that will remain nameless that also taught me very valuable lessons just from my observation of their actions and how they move. Uh, there were drug dealers, hustlers, pimps, and they all had really nice cars, dressed really nice, nice clothes, um, always had beautiful women with them, seemed to get a lot of respect from the people in the, in the neighborhoods and everything, but it was more about fear than it was respect, but it looked good from the outside looking in. But I also would hear 
later on how this person went to jail for this amount of time or this person got locked up. Had this one incident where a big time drug dealer approached me and offered me an opportunity with him. He told me that at the time I had a, a BMW, a little 320i that, I, that was very nice to me. And he told me that I already had a nice car. So, you know, it wouldn't be any surprise that I was driving a nice car. And that, you know, he knew I used to work on my 66 Mustang in my grandmother's garage. And so he told me that, you know, he could drop the drugs off there and I could get it there. And he would show me how to divide it up, cut it up and all that kind of stuff and how much money I could make. And so this was a very attractive offer because I saw all the money he was making and everything. And so I told him, I said, let me think about it. And that's what I did. And I came to conclusion that that just wasn't for me. And so he gave that opportunity to another one of my good friends, a guy named Billy. And Billy took him up on his offer and he gave Billy what they call an eight ball, a small amount of cocaine. And Billy ended up going out to the club, getting high with the cocaine, sharing it with women that he was meeting at the clubs and everything. And when it came time to pay this brother back his money, Billy didn't have his money. So now Billy was on the run, right? And so it just so happens that Billy lived in an apartment on the third in a third floor apartment in the attic of a house that was right across the street from the girl that I was dating at the time. And when I went to go visit my girlfriend at that time, I looked across the street and the whole entire top of the house had been burned up. I don't know how just the top were burned up, but the top of the house was totally burned up. And he was holding some of my furniture as I was in transition at that time. And so when I looked at the third floor apartment, I could see all of my furniture in there, all charred and blackened and burnt up and just the frames to my sofa and the chrome and glass tables that I had were all black and charred and everything. And Billy was on the run. They were trying to catch Billy and eventually they caught up with Billy and they almost beat him to death. But a very good friend of mine, a mutual friend of of ours that we had in common at that time was there and he stopped them from beating Billy to death and then Billy eventually fled to the south and no one ever saw him again. And so just observing those people's actions showed me a path that I knew wasn't for me because I knew whatever I did to become successful, I did not want to end up in nobody's prison cell. I'm not built for that life. Growing up, there were a good number of my friends who had their fathers present in their household. But one of my friends, Sean Jennings, I really admired Sean because of his family. He had his mother and father in the household. He had two older brothers and Sean was a very unique person in my opinion. Sean had the ability to focus and accomplish goals that he set for himself with such great determination that it was really amazing to me. And I never said this to Sean during those years, but I always watched him and I learned an immense amount from Sean. One of the things that I also learned from Sean, funny thing, we went to a party one time at the YMCA and I got dressed and I walked down to his house and when I got there, he was kind of looking at me, but he didn't say anything, you know, and he got dressed and we left. And so we went to the party and everything. We had a good time. And then later on, I realized the reason he was looking at me like that was because I had these big Buster Brown shoes on. They had these big fat heels on them. They were all shiny on the top and, you know, real thick. And so that became a running joke. And from that moment, I learned more about how to dress, more about fashion. I started really recognizing nice shoes, nice quality shoes. You know, I would save my money. I would buy all my clothes. I put them on layaway. I would have all the hottest gear when I went back to school. And Sean inspired that in me. He really taught me a lot about fashion and how to dress. 
and how to dress professional because he also taught me about wearing ties and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, Sean was a very, very big inspiration in my life. And he's a very, very, very successful businessman to this very day. But most importantly, I'd like to talk about my dad. One day I was with a group of friends. I was probably in my late twenties, maybe early thirties. And I was with a group of friends and we were all talking as we were watching the football game. And everyone, we were kind of in a circle and everyone was talking about their relationship with their fathers. And so one by one, each person spoke and they would say stuff like, man, I ain't seen my dad since I was little. I ain't never seen my dad, man. I can't stand that name, you know? And I was really shocked to hear the things that these men were saying about their dad. And so when it came time for me to speak about my relationship with my father, I had to say that, you know, I can't, I, I couldn't identify with any of what they were saying because my father was the most important man in my life. He was the greatest man in my life. I will always love and respect him for the examples that he showed me every day he had the opportunity to. He told me that he always had this fear that we would be separated for some reason early in our life, in my life. And so for that reason, he wanted to spend every possible minute with me. He spent so much time with me that when I think back on the earlier years of my life, it's hard for me to see my mother because I was always with my father. I mean, always with my father. And he used to have a tape recorder we used to take around and every place we went, we would record our conversations. And so years later, I had these cassettes and I was able to play them and hear my conversation when I was like three, four years old with my dad. And then I did the same thing with my kids. And so when I play the tapes with me and my son, my, my firstborn son, when I play our conversations back, it sounds exactly like the conversations me and my dad used to have. And it really touched my heart. Something you guys should try. I know people don't carry tape recorders anymore but you have recording devices at your disposal still. And so my dad used to always tell me how he wished he was smarter. He wished he had made different decisions. He wished he had more to give me, so forth and so on. And I tried to reassure him that he's given me more than anything that I could have ever asked for. He's been the best father to me that I could have ever imagined, despite the things that he couldn't do as he said couldn't do um but here's the most important thing he did leave me with my dad became muslim when i was about three years old four years old maybe and he lost a lot of friends at that time but he never he never gave up on what he believed and he became so dedicated to what he believed that he would make his prayer on time, anytime the time presented itself, no matter where we were. I remember as a kid, I was working on my, my 66 Mustang. I took it to my mechanic and I wanted my dad to see all this work I had done on my Mustang. And it was time for prayer. And he went right out in the middle of the parking lot and made his prayer right there in the middle of the parking lot. And at that time I was kind of embarrassed about it but shortly after that, I grew to really respect his dedication his lo and his loyalty to what he believed. And it never mattered what anyone else thought. He did what he needed to do, what he believed to be right. And he instilled these things in me. And so as a child, I was probably about eight years old maybe, he taught me prayers in Arabic. He taught me how to pray as a Muslim and although I didn't practice Islam all throughout my life, I was always brought back to that because I couldn't understand why I was unable to forget these intricate, complex prayers in Arabic. Mind you, I don't even know them in English. I only know most of them in Arabic. Let me give you an example. This is Al-Fatiha. Al-Fatiha is the very first surah or prayer 
of the Holy Quran. And it goes like this. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin rahmanir rahim maliki yawmiddin iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ihdina siratal mustaqim siratal ladina an'amta alayhim ghairil maghdubi alayhim waladdallin amin how do i still know that and there's so many more and i've never been able to forget them and so what i just recently have come to realize is that the most important thing my dad left me with it wasn't the nice cars it wasn't a house when he passed away it wasn't a quarter million dollar life insurance policy he didn't leave me that kind of stuff because he didn't have that kind of stuff but what he left me that was most important was the knowledge to know how to pray i always hear him in the back of my head talking to me about the importance of my prayer my spirituality and he used to tell me all the time that he was praying for me that I would get on the right track as he saw the right track to be and you know most of us as our parents children we become a little more resistant to what they're trying to instill in us at times when it's a persistent kind of thing and so now i really realize the significance and the importance of what he was teaching me and i remember all these things to this very day and now i'm beginning to implement these things more and more and the reason i'm implementing these things that he taught me that i remember is because as i reflect on the quality of his life i saw all the people around him that no longer remained friends with him or had this to say or that to say or whatever i saw the trajectory of their life and i saw the trajectory slash consistency rather of my dad's life and he had a very good quality life he never needed for anything he made good money in his retirement he still had good money coming in he just lived a great life and he left the best example for me that i could ever have hoped for and so um these were the men that spoke to me there were many others in between you know my brother who inspired the artistic abilities that i eventually um developed uh he was a great artist or is a great artist and he inspired that in me um there were just a lot of people but what i can tell you is that you have to be able to see it in order to be it and so young men today especially young black men today need their fathers in their lives and if that is just not possible for whatever reason they still need male role models and male figures in their lives that can help guide them and teach them more about becoming a man because many of us as grown men we walk around here in men bodies but we're still children in our minds because we haven't been taught and we haven't seen examples to help lead us in the right directions and so we're out here aimlessly trying to be men failing miserably so those are the men that spoke to me we're here in the lions den where we are restoring kings and queens one conversation at a time and i hope you guys check out other stories from the men who spoke to me